you for this wonderful welcome. And last time I gave a talk actually about the book was uh, it was two years ago when the book was published. So now uh, the talk will be a little bit different because since I have written this book, um, you know, through my studies of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and also uh, Jung, but especially the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and, and practice, spiritual practice, because as by spiritual detective, I also mean um, a spiritual seeker myself. Uh, you know, my knowledge of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene has deepened and I couldn't help but notice some similarities between uh, Carl Jung, uh, uh, definitions and stages of individuation and, and what the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is teaching, which, you know, I, I actually ran a workshop on uh, Mary Magdalene, the alchemist, and it really struck me. Can I start right now? Like, yeah, just you, You've started. <laughs> started because it really struck me that uh, you know Jung had so many right intuitions you know he had so many right intuitions and sometimes it was uh, you know before the, his time but also before uh, certain discoveries were made and I'm going to discuss it uh, as we go and at any stage you can ask me questions and if I go too fast please let me know I have few pages of the notes here so um because it's the first time ever that i deliver this particular talk so you know i just want to make sure that everything is in order so i'm not, just not going to mix up too much information all at once so i think like every decent speaker i should tell everyone what i'm going to discuss in detail right so first of all i will uh give a definition of individual, one of the definitions of actually two definitions of individuation by Carl Jung in different periods of his life. Then I'm going to uh, briefly discuss uh, Jung and Gnostic connection, you know, uh, and if, if somebody wants to know what Gnostics are, I can elaborate a little bit. Why is it important? And then uh, my idea of uh, Mary Magdalene, the alchemist, which I discussed in my book and I covered in my talk, I think two years ago. And, and then some mysteries of Isis, briefly. And because then I want us to move on to the content of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, how it was discovered first, then the content of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and how it corresponds to some ideas of individuation by Carl Jung. And right from the beginning, I want to say that it's not necessarily kind of linear connection, uh, but, but there's a very strong correspondence. Does it make sense? So we have quite a bit to cover. So uh, I'll start first with Carl Jung. I think we owe him this, right? This is, uh, this is his society. And, and really the talk is about him and Mary Magdalene and her gospel. So first time that, uh, as far as I know, that Jung uh, mentioned the process of individuation, it was in his PhD thesis, actually, from 1902, and it was called on the psychology and pathology of a so-called occult phenomena. And it is kind of funny because, you know, later in his life, actually like 10 years later, not much later, he was really into, you know, occult and Gnosticism and all the mysterious spiritual things in life. But here at this stage, I think he was still very much influenced by, by Sigmund Freud. So that's why he was approaching it very cautiously. When we're talking about individuation also, he was talking more in the sense that Freud understood when he you know, later himself defined. And then in 1912, so when he already is, was breaking away from Freud, he gives a this really nice definition of individuation, which is he completely his own. And it's in two uh, essays on analytical psychology. And they were the relations between the ego and the unconscious and the, on the psychology of the unconscious. So now I will just read the definition and unpack it, if it's okay. So the definition is uh, of individuation. Uh, and I like when it is sometimes spelled in and individuation, so in individuation, right? hyphenated. The process by which we bring together all our parts, which results in creating, it's, it's important, creating, because it's a creative process, and embracing, so we accept, it's a form of self-acceptance as well, the incompatible or seemingly incompatible uh, uniqueness of our individual self. 
which I believe was always of, and this is really important, of spiritual nature and the final point in the development of human psyche. So I think it is a beautiful definition simply because it teaches a couple of things that we are work in process, right? Because we are creating, it's a process of creating and embracing. So it means self-accepting of very different parts of ourselves, which feels sometimes very chaotic. You know, there, I know there are many different Joannas, for example, <laughs> right? And this is why we are going to talk about the different uh, levels of individuation. And also in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And he believes that this is a spiritual process. And this is really clearly, you know, separates him from Freud in this way. And also makes him, even nowadays, a complete pioneer in psychology, in spiritual psychology, because it's still kind of, you know, moving around as emotional intelligence, as this and that, as, you know, cognitive psychology. But people kind of dance around it. And he just basically said this is a spiritual process and the most and, and the final process in the development of human psyche. So this is the most important process, so to speak. So this is how and another definition, which he even later in his life he gave, which I really love and it relates to the both to the gospel of Mary Magdalene and the last level of um, individuation is uh, we can equate it individuation, we can equate it with self-realization, right? So it means self-realization. And then I think we have to understand what self-realization is. Because here, Jung was already influenced by many things. And one of them was also, uh, I'm not going to give it much time in this talk, uh, by Hinduism, of course, right? So his self-realization wasn't just like you re realize necessarily as an individual, you fulfill your dreams or new age parlance and so on. But basically you are at the highest octave of your own development as a human being. It's just, it's as good as it gets. You know, you're like the Buddha, you reach Christ consciousness, you know, whatever it is that you want to call. And in fact, his concepts of the self is very different from Freud because it's very much to the, uh, in many ways, to the Hindu or Buddhist concept of the self, which is capital S, you know, when it's, it's a capital S self, not a self like almost the same as ego. It's very different from the ego. In fact, it's a journey from the ego towards the self, which is the process of individuation. So, uh, and by then we know just very briefly about this Hindu uh, influence. It is, we know that uh, uh, Carl Jung was a little bit naughty in some of his relationships and some of the women he knew, you know, influenced him. One of them influenced him about Hinduism. And I think there was a little bit of a menage a trois there because he lived with his wife and this other woman and she had a very huge influence on him. But this is completely on a side, just as we discuss uh, his definition. And then I want to, before we can actually plunge in into the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, I think that we really have to uh, cover a little bit his connection with the Gnostics. So who are the Gnostics very quickly? And uh, it is uh, basically, a, most recently it is understood as early Christians who didn't connect, you know, with the uh, Romanized church, institutionalized church. However, we also know now, which is more recent research, that Gnostics were actually closely associated with the mysteries of e ancient Egypt. So these people who already were initiated very often to the mysteries of ancient Egypt and then connected with the teachings of Christ and so on, you know, they, they are also called the Gnostics. Because it is no coincidence that Gnostics were primarily uh, located in Alexandria in northern Egypt. So Jung said that Gnostics, so just to cover you know, who the Gnostics were, they are not just Christians, they are actually deeply rooted in esoteric tradition of Egypt, but it's a very recent research. So Jung believed that the Gnostics were his old friends. This is a quote his old friends, because they focus on the interiority of religious or spiritual experience, not on uh, uh, rituals uh, and, 
and you know kind of other forms of religion you know that each church has you know or each religion not necessarily even christian religion has but they gnosis means basically inner knowledge the inner spark right and this is what he really was interested in it so it's quite interesting and in fact in 1916 he wrote his seven sermons to the dead. And this is a very kind of intuitive download that he got. At least he says it in his autobiography. And um, after a very strange event, then, you know, he believes that uh, the bell was ringing at the door in his house and his wife and children heard it and, uh, and a maid heard it. And, and then he went upstairs and then he basically downloaded this message from, uh, from Basilides, who was a Gnostic teacher from Alexandria, second century of Alexandria. And in a sense, it is a, his seven sermons to the dead, which are very actually difficult and symbolic sermons. In the last sermon, he basically talks about process of individuation and self-realization because he says that humanity is placed somewhere between like between the, the, the stars and the angels and animals. And it is our duty to basically reach our self-realization, right? Because we are the gate, we are the portal to this evolution. So that's very beautiful. So, um, and more, I just, just want to say that it's quite interesting when in his seven sermons to the dead, he was also talking about the fact that the dead who showed up in his room, in his office, from uh, uh, led by Basilides, that they said that they went to Jerusalem, which represented for him a, like institutionalized religions, and they didn't find there what they sought. So they had to go to Alexandria, which was a Gnostic center, right? So this is, he was definitely fascinated by the Gnostics. So now a little bit more of a background. So in 1945, uh, Nag Hammadi discovery happened. So what happened? This is when a, a number of uh, Gnostic writings, including the Gospel of Thomas and Gospel of to uh, Philip, were found. And uh, and uh, there was a big drama about who translates what and what happens. And some of Jung's friends managed to smuggle some of the papyri, and so out of Egypt you know, illegally, and, and, and then they presented to him on his 80th birthday, and it is called the Jungian Codex until nowadays, right? So Jungian Codex. And it was, so, but I just want to stress that it was just a testimony to his lifelong fascination with Gnostic teachers, teachers and teachings about the interiority of our life, and that this... Uh, Jungian Codex or this papyri that actually were discovered in 1945 when didn't reach him until he was eight years old. So he had all of his intuitions but on his own because although, you know, seven sermons to the dead were kind of a, a download, as we would say uh, nowadays. And, you know, he, was, he, he didn't sign it as Carl Jung, he signed it as Basilides, which is second century Alexandrian teacher. But we actually even nowadays know very little about Basilides. So it, it was a, some kind of psychic phenomenon, right, that, that, that he experienced. When, and just very briefly after, you know, his interest in Gnostics, he also developed his interest in alchemy later, which is a separate talk. And again, extremely intuitive. He, this man is amazing because he was talking about crater or crater. And he said that, which is a part of the upper, uh, upper instrument in the alchemical uh, um, machinery, so to speak. And he intuitively knew that it was uh, feminine and it actually represents the womb. A woman's womb. So he said that he understood that the feminine is somehow really important for the process of individuation. So, but he was walking a little bit in the dark because there was very little known about it then, right? Although he knew about a famous alchemists from the, I think, third century Zosimus, and he was analyzing his writings and his dreams and so on. 
He also made a very intuitive and correct connection, now we know, between Osi the mysteries of, of Osiris, which are really mysteries of Isis and Osiris, and, and the figure of Jesus. However, he didn't make a connection between Isis and, and, and Mary Magdalene, which I did in my book, and other people actually did, so it's not just me. So what are the mysteries of Isis before we jump in into the Gospel of Mary Magdalene? So mysteries of... <laughs> I don't even know where to start. So I think we do know the story of Isis and Osiris. So Isis and Osiris, Isis was an Egyptian goddess and she had also other names, which we discuss in the process of, of uh, this lecture. And, you know, Osiris was her husband who was killed by his evil brother, Seth. And Isis, as the legend says, or the myth says, without symbolic... Um, interpretation, uh, resurrected, collected the 14 parts of Osiris because he was cut into small parts by his brother who killed him. And, uh, and it, resurrecting him, resurrected him for long enough to conceive a child, Horus. So this is a kind of very basic interpretation of, uh, of a smith. So what is the kind of esoteric interpretation of a smith? So esoteric interpretation of this myth is such, but also is mentioned actually in the Gospel of Philip, which is an early Christian work, which basically uh, Osiris represents humanity. So this is esoteric teaching of ancient Egypt. So as a, Osiris represents humanity. Isis represents the hierophant, so it means she is the, the initiator, so to speak. So she is the initiator. And Horus, which is their child, is Osiris or humanity res uh, resurrected, so to speak, or self-realized. Does it make sense? Do we understand? So it's, it's the resurrect Osiris, Horus is a resurrected Osiris or resurrected humanity. And Isis, which is this feminine element, is the hierophant, like in the tarot cards, but hierophant is basically the initiator. So it's the initiator. So what are these initiations, which are also mentioned in the Gospel of Philip? So initiation is, in the Gospel of Philip, they say that the naive believe that you die and then you are resurrected. But the initiated know that first you are initiated and then you die. Does it make sense? Because the process of initiation in ancient Egypt, and which is called as mystery of Nephthys or mystery of Isis, was based on the ritual in which a person was placed after given some potions in a sarcophagus, like for example, in the pyramid of Giza or in the temples of Ta uh, Karnak uh, in the south, sh show the process actually in the, in, the, in the engravings. And then is led into the kind of near death experience or they call it death experience. And there they were had to face usually for three days, all kinds of um, psychic phenomena, or you could say occult phenomena, such as like facing the first demons, or maybe, uh, you know, their shadow, right? And then uh, seeing the light and what, and reaching self-realization and re reaching the um, liberation from their body while still alive. And then when they were allowed, they were brought back to life, so to speak, and they, were, and, and they could function again in life, knowing that there is, so to speak, life after death. Does it make sense? So they were taken through the whole process of like dying, facing the demons, uh, I don't know, external or internal, they believe they were external, facing all the good guides after that, only if you face the demons, otherwise some people, 
didn't want to go any further because it was a too scary experience, right? But then they couldn't get uh, through the, till the end of the initiation. And then only then they, they basically were brought back to life, uh, physical life, knowing that this is just a stage on which we play. And there is much more, but there is the life that is actually deeper uh, and, and uh, outside of our physical existence, so to speak. So, um, and in fact, uh, when he was talking about uh, alchemy, he also, as I said, he made, a he, he, he made some connections, but the connection that I also, I made is that um, I believe that actually Mary Magdalene, and this is why I'm going through this uh, um, talk about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene in a moment. Mary Magdalene was the same person as Mary the Alchemist or Mary the Prophetess, which is a historical figure in ancient first century ancient Egypt, who was an alchemist, was an alchemist called a spiritual alchemist, which was talking about Trans, uh, transcending materialism, so to speak, and uh, being elevating to higher level of consciousness. And this is what I believe the Gospel of Mary Magdalene actually is. Um, so she was talking about transmutation of consciousness. And this is what the mysteries of Isis were talking about, transmutation of consciousness. So we realize that we are not only just this material or physical existence. Okay, so now we can get to the core <laughs> of the topic, so to speak. So uh, perhaps just I may share something, share screen. Okay. I would like to very briefly discuss the discovery of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene very quickly. So in... Um, I'm just che checking my dates here. In 1896, in 1896, uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene was discovered in Akmin here. And then it was in Coptic. And then a year later, but it, we are not sure if it was a year later or between 1897 and 1906, Another Greek copy was discovered in Orenkurus here. So it's a little bit north of here. And it roughly looked like that. Okay, so the first one looked like that, right? So it's lots of this missing here, right? So this is the um, actual uh, Coptic version, the 1896 version of my Gospel of Mary Magdalene. So, uh, uh, so there's the one uh, called Berlin, the one is called Berlin Codex, the, the one from 1896, and the one later in Greek is called the Rylands Papyrus, I think, 463. So Jung couldn't know about it because this was not translated until much later, but there are some correspondences anyway. What I find it also interesting, it, it just as a, maybe a, uh, on the... Um, on the side of this conversation that the Gospel of Mary Magdalene was found in Akmin, which is a modern name for uh, Panapolis. And, uh, uh, and the third century alchemist about whom Jung wrote, Zosimus, was from uh, Panapolis or from Akmin. And he was talking about Mary the, the alchemist who was, uh, talking about transmuting our consciousness was also for, known as Mary the, uh, the prophetess. So, you know, I, this is about my theory that Mary Magdalene was Mary the alchemist. Okay, so now I just, this was just an introduction and let's move on to the uh, correspondences between some parts of the gospel of Mary Magdalene and, and Jung's uh, theory of uh, our process of individuation. Any questions so far? Are you good? Are we good? Yes? Yeah? Okay. So uh, the first part, I'm not discussing the first part of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene because it doesn't relate to the, to the Jungian process of individuation. So we're going to part two. And there are some, as you, as you saw on, on, on the papyrus, there are some pages missing and parts of missing. So page part two starts on page 15. And it's just... Uh, kind of right in the middle of, of a conversation, so to speak. 
which talks about part two starts with about talking about four levels of consciousness or four levels of ascension, four levels of transmutation of consciousness, which is exactly like the uh, mysteries of Isis uh, talked. And it starts this way, that the disciples uh, ask uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, teach uh, Mary, please uh, share with us what teacher uh, told you and didn't share with us. So please tell us what he told you that he didn't share with us, because we know that we, he shared some other things with you that he didn't share with us. And this is where her teaching actually starts at this stage. So she says, it's okay, so the first part, the first uh, level of consciousness is what we would call wrong identification. So I think like if you're familiar with the process of individuation, it starts to make sense. So it's a wrong identification. And it says, and in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, it says, in attachment to matter, attachment to matter is against your true nature. And the next one is be vigilant. It is not outside. It is not there. It is inside you. Okay. So then uh, what does it mean? So basically it means it explains that uh, only you believe at this level of uh, awareness, we believe that only material reality exists. And I think I, this is kind of sad thing because we all were there and I think perhaps even the majority of humanity still believes that, right? So only material reality exists. And in uh, it uses uses some neoplatonic vocabulary, so it's also talk, it's about soma. Soma is just a physical uh, reality, and I believe that it corresponds to Jung's uh, first stage of individuation, which is the persona, right? And persona in Greek means a mask that actors used to wear. And what is persona in Jung? So it is just a, it's your social face. Like you want to be a model citizen because, you know, we are all socialized, right? It is, um, uh, it is all I should. I should do this. I should do that, <laughs> right? So, for example, what you uh, very nicely, you know, this particular bio note, which I now change, because I realized as I was preparing for this talk, that this is very much a social persona. It is just Joanna as an academic, right? But there is much more <laughs> to Joanna than just an academic. In fact, the best parts, right, are not that. It's, it's not the academic. And it is also, so this is uh, the desire to be respectable. You know, what do you do? right, when you go to the parties. So for example, when I went to this uh, hairdresser in Brisbane and he says, so what do you do? I said, oh, I'm an author, you know, and I'm interested in esoteric teachings. So I said, no, but what do you really do? And I said, okay, I'm a lecturer at university. And then he was impressed, right? <laughs> because he really meant, okay, but you know, how do you actually earn money? This is what he meant, right? So this is this persona. Right, and we are all attached. And, and when we talk about uh, spiritual evolution on the different levels of consciousness, this is what Jung says. It's it's normal to have this persona, but it is a it's wrong when it is it is an inflated over identification. So you think you are just this, you are just a husband, you are just the doctor, you are just an academic, right? And in the mysteries of my Isis, it would mean uh, amunet, amunet or Isis, which is seen as the matron, as the mother who later became in Catholic Church, Virgin Mary, right? So she is this kind of respectable Roman citizen, you, the matron in Patris Familias, right? So this is just this, forgetting her mysterious parts, which we we'll discuss later. She, she's just this, she's the mother, the matron, right? So it is her social persona. So this is the correspondence that I found very interesting between 
and uh, you know wrong identification there's only physical matter but it takes you away from your true essence from two you know it's okay we're also physical beings but it takes us from our physical from our true essence and both Jung and gospel of Mary Magdalene talk about it although Jung could not know about it right so it's quite interesting now the second level is um, is uh, uh, craving or uh, in in the gospel of Mary Magdalene which is basically where all our desires are stored, okay? All our desires, especially forbidden desires, are stored. And the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, when you unpack it, teaches us that there are, there are two paths with desire. One is of suppression and the other one is of integration. And it says, you can drop it like a garment, all right? And also it says the sin, because we're all afraid to be sinners, right? In the religious terms, right? In the religious terms. And it says sin as such does not exist. Right? You have to integrate it. And in fact, in uh, ancient Egyptian teachings, it is called the Osiris' spine. And you remember Osiris represents humanity in uh, ancient Egyptian es esoterica, which means this is in Osiris' spine, this is where the desires are stored. Right? And you can either integrate them or you can suppress them. So I believe that there's a strong correspondence here between uh, uh, between uh, second level of consciousness as discussed in Mary Magdalene and the shadow, Jungian shadow. Because Jung says shadow is what we are, what we are trying to dis disown within our own psyche. and something that we cannot wish out of, out of existence at the same time. So we don't want to own it, you know, because this is something we do not accept about ourselves, but there is no other way. And there's absolutely no other way. And he says also, it is very, facing our shadow is heroic endeavor that creates havoc in our lives. And it is absolutely true because I want to, you know, refer back to our own experience for people who, you know, analysts or people who go through analysis or people who go spiritual awakening like I did, or for example, including by, you know, through the reading of the gospel of Mary Magdalene, because I'm also a spiritual seeker. Spiritual awakening is a hell. You know, it is not like, you know, walk on brass petals, you know, sing songs and hold hands. It is just like when I had a spiritual awakening, I said, what? You know, I had plans. <laughs> you know? I have a career to take care of. I have publications to do. I also want to be a literary writer. And it suddenly does not matter, but it matters. So there's this real kind of struggle between the ego and the self very real struggle and it creates havoc and we disintegrate it is like being electrocuted that's how it felt for me we disintegrate and lots of people cannot pass the stage because it is such a heroic endeavor as Carl Jung rightly says right some people say take it away you know I want to go back to my persona you know, I, I cannot face it. You know, I lost this, I lost my mortgage, I lost my job, you know, like, uh, and it may be, you know. However, it is important to remember that this is just a stage, right? This is just, just, just one stage. And you just being, we are just being shown like this is, this is, you know, you over identify with something and there is so much more, but it is so difficult because we have to trust, right? So uh, what is a shadow in, for example, in ancient Egyptian mysteries? It's the Nef goddess, goddess Nephthys. 
goddess Nephthys is not it's it's Isis, but it's not the mother Isis, you know, that there's just like a good matron that Roman family could accept, right? She could, she could be a senator's wife, right? Which she wasn't. Nephthys is the dark side of well, shadow side, because she's not bad. Shadow side of Isis, she is the hierophant that will lead you to realization that there is more than physical existence. And she's also the great ma magician. But this is where in uh, ancient Egyptian lore, high magic comes to place when you actually rearrange the whole reality, or perhaps in Jungian terms, collective unconscious. So it is Nephthys. This, this is one that you don't see it because you know on, 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 on all icons you, you, you see Isis, the matron, you know, the, her husband and the child in the middle, not understanding that she's the hero fund, her husband is humanity, and her child is the awakened humanity. All right. So Nephthys is like behind. Very often she's shown like behind, you know, like her back you can see her back because she, she is the shadow she represents the shadow and in our lives so for example um in mary magdalene because we're talking about her gospel it is the supposed mary magdalene the harlot because she's it's the suppressed eros you know, and it is just projected on her. And we know that she was not a harlot, but it is. So, 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 or any aesthetic, you know, the saying that we're goody, goody, you know, somebody who is too good to be true, right? Or maybe an angry activist. They have a good cause and they are right, but there's so much suppressed anger. You know, it's anger. They're just using this anger, which is good. But, you know, they are not integrating something. So for me personally, maybe just to make it more personable, it, it, it was like the rebel, for example. So, and it is a saboteur also, because I had all of these academic opportunities and I was rebelling against them because I knew that it's just as Jung said about persona, it's just a sliver of your personality. And it was just asking me to pr truly progress as an academic it was asking me to give up parts of my other parts of my personality, which were in a shadow, but were really important to me, which I wanted to integrate. So even recently, I had an opportunity, I had an opportunity to apply for, um, I was offered, you know, associate professor, but then I had to do things that I didn't want to do and I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing here. And then, then you have to ask yourself, how much am I willing to sacrifice for the persona, right? Rather than integrating the shadow, right? Rather than integrating the shadow. So I hope it makes sense. Now, level three of uh, <clears throat> development of consciousness, or I keep forgetting the heter transmutation of consciousness, which is an alchemical process, is ignorance versus higher wisdom in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Now, what is news? Okay, ignorance, so in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, it is called news, N-O-U-S. So um, maybe I'll just read it from the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. If I can find it. Hmm. Yeah. This is what Jesus says to Mary Magdalene when she sees him after his resurrection or after his death, after cru crucifixion, which is more neutral, after his crucifixion, and he uh, she sees him in a liminal space. Not a space, you know, like in is reading the Bible when they see him and he has a body and so on, but he is like an apparition. She sees him in a liminal space. And it is there is this beautiful imaginal. This is what they call the imaginal, which means it is real, but it is not physical. Okay. And he says to Mary Magdalene, You are blessed as my sight doesn't disturb you 
and you can see me because other disciples don't see him because he's real, but he's not material anymore. Okay. And he says, where there is news, there is treasure. And you see me in the news. N-O-U-S. So in news, it is in neoplatonic terminology that he that here is being used. Nous is the hook between uh, the soul and eternity, so to speak. The soul and 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 and, and uh, divine consciousness. Sometimes people say it is the, the heart of the teaching. Okay, but it is beyond the mind and it is beyond the physical, yet it is completely real. Yes. It's quite interesting because it is a Greek word, nous, and it uh, corresponds to uh, uh, ancient Egyptian esoterica, a sekem, which is a ancient Egyptian word. And sekem represents, has two, has two ends, sekem, has two ends. It's, a, it's like a tour, it has two ends. And sekem has uh, two ends. One is the power to rule over others, that's one choice, which is a lower choice. And the higher choice is the power to transform yourself. And it is quite interesting because nowadays, I don't know how conspiratorial we want to get. There's lots of uh, uh, talk about, you know, darker powers and people in power and, you know, a kind of occult. And I think that these people can be sometimes highly evolved because they reach, reach the level of news or second, but they choose the rule over others, right? Instead of the rule to tr power to transform yourself. And this is what I'm pretty sure. So this is what Mary Magdalene says. It's, you know, that's the choice to make. And in Jungian terminology, it would be anima, which is the next level, right? Anima in this sense means the soul, but it also has a, it's a feminine. It is your inner personality, basically. It is your inner personality so this is like in ancient egyptian uh, esoterica this is like neftis and mary magdalene uh, neftis and isis integrate right and mary magdalene is the disciple and the teacher So on a personal level, like for me, I was thinking, what is I, so the spiritual detective? This is it is a, also a, a form of a identity, but it's an identity that is closer to who I am, right? So rather than just academic, right, or a re academic that is kind of reluctant academic, and then so spiritual detective, right? Uh, so for me, it would be that. Mm -hmm. So this is third level, so it's anima. It's quite interesting because in Jung, he also, when he was talking about it, and you know, Jung likes to write in circles. He's not like, doesn't make clear distinctions sometimes. He also said that for him, it could be also the other woman. And we know that there were other women, right? In his life. So the, the other woman, right? But for me, it was also the other woman because um, when I think like for us, it is the other woman, in which sense it could be. But it could be the way that uh, we don't integrate certain feminine part of ourselves, especially if we are professional women, right? Because what we are left is like either the, the matron or the professional. So here we have to integrate, right? This, you know, not this or that. So this is the third one. The fourth one, which is the highest level in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, it is called either Ra or, or Pneuma, Pneuma in Greek. And it basically is our own self-doubt and it's also the voice of the world. So we are now completely just, you know, this is this one moment in life when you think you got it and the world kind of brings you down again, right? And all your self doubts bring it down. So it is. I like to compare it to a lover. You know, you broke up with a guy or with a woman, 
and you think you're completely over them and then they call <laughs> you know like let, let, one more try or you decided you don't want this job and then they because it is you know just your mask right it's just your persona and then they offer you this job and it usually happens when you actually already evolved and move on it's like the final test so this is what it is and this is the voice which could be the voice of the ego or our own voice so this is from the gospel of Mary magdalene or it could be the voice of a, a collective a social collective such as and i'm quoting here from the gospel of Mary magdalene who do you think you are? Where, where do you come from, murderer? And where are you going, vagabond? So basically, you're nobody without the mask, right? But if you do not listen to this voice, then pneuma is actually divine consciousness. So you cannot go any higher. So this is the, the top end of the alchemical process. Now you, I'm looking for this word again. Now you went through the full transmutation of your consciousness. And now you are free of everything and you repose, and it's in the gospel of Mary Magdalene, you go into silence and repose in eternity. Right, like this is, you can play your part and do all of this, but you know it is just a part. You just watch it, you're the witness, right? And you participate when you have to participate, but you're actually in silence and, and, and you are part of eternity. So um, it is basically what uh, in Christianity could be called Christ consciousness or Buddhahood or Atman, depending on religion. And for Jung, it's a process of self-realization. This is the top end of a process of self-realization or individuation. So the process, and this is Jung, the process by which a person, a psychological a person, the process by which a person is recognizing his or her own innermost uniqueness. And what is interesting, the gospel of Mary Magdalene ends with these words, which are very mysterious and also remind me of the esoteric of ancient Egypt. So I may be quoted for you. I left the world with the aid of another world. So there is some kind of almost supernatural um, interference. A lower design was erased by virtue of higher design. So there is a certain level of a process of individuation, uh, almost like a higher power gets involved. Right, like you, 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 you climb, you climb, you climb, and eventually, you like you meet with something and it pulls you up. And what's interesting because according to the ancient Egyptian esoterica, that means that the reality itself, collectively, not only an individual reality, is transformed. So it means if you transform yourself you transform your reality. Does it make sense? And you can transform collective reality at the same time. And in ancient Egyptian esoterica, it is called the high magic of Isis. So basically correcting creation, what should have been created right from the beginning. So you actually rearrange the, the mind of God, right? Because now um, you're on that level. So I hope it made sense. You know, it was perhaps a little bit technical, but I think that there are some strong... Um, correspondences because there are four levels of consciousness 
and there are four uh, in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and there are four levels of uh, individuation in Carl Jung as well. And there's a strong uh, correspondence between, you know, identification with matter, which is wrong, according to the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which is called, for example, Soma in uh, Neoplatonism, and, um, and, uh, and the persona. Then there is uh, facing your most innermost desires, you know, it can take you up and can get you down because each level of consciousness in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, you know, you can go up or you can go down, right? So this is like facing of a shadow, you know, the process of integration or suppression, so to speak. Then there is level, third level, which is Nus in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or Sekem in Egypt, which is the liminal space, which in in um, where you can, um, which in, in, in uh, Jung is called the anima or the soul. And the fourth one, when you integrate things. And the fourth one is like the final integration basically with the divine consciousness or with something infinite. Infinity. Actually, Gospel of Mary Magdalene doesn't talk about divine consciousness or what pneuma is this, or pneuma in English as you pronounce it, but it is talking about I now can repose in eternity. I go into silence and I can repose in eternity, which sounds like the last level of mm, uh, individuation as uh, self realization, which is both personal and collective but it starts with the personal and then you change the collective and collective around you changes because you went through this. So I hope it makes sense. Also, I just wanted to thank you. I just wanted to tell you because it's quite interesting from a point of view of Mary Magdalene, because uh, when she finishes this teaching, which is very difficult, right? It is very difficult. As I agree, like, you know, I just spent 20 years doing it, right? So it made this connection. So uh, she says, then when she stopped, he, having said all of this, Mary became silent, right? Because she says, now I can repose in a silence. For it was in silence that the teacher spoke to her, the teacher as Jesus, right? The Christ consciousness. Then Andrew, one of the apostles, um, then Andrew began to speak and said to his brothers, which means other apostles, tell me, what do you think of this thing that she has been telling us? <laughs> and uh, as for me, I do not believe that the teacher speak like, spoke like this. <laughs> no. Right? And Peter said, you know, Peter, the supposed first apostle, right? Because the Gnostics disagreed. They thought that Mary Magdalene was the first apostle. Peter added, how is it possible, they're pissed off, how is it possible that the teacher talked to this, in this manner to this woman about secrets of which we ourselves are igno ignorant? Why should we listen to this woman? <laughs> if a head to us. Then Mary wept and she said, my brother, what are you thinking? Do you believe that this is a figment of my own imagination that I didn't see the teacher in the vision? And at this Levi, another apostle spoke up. Peter, you have always been bad tempered and now we see you repudi rep repudiating a woman just as ad adversaries do. Yet if the teacher held her worthy, who are you to reject her? Surely the teacher knew her very well, for he loved her more than us. So uh, this is basically also a kind of call for esoteric and kind of um, spiritual understanding of the teachings. Right, so basically, what it teaches us that behind every spiritual teaching, 
like in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, there is another level. It's like an onion. And actually, Jung was talking about onion when he was talking about the process of individuation. Like it's peeling an onion. And, and the deeper you go, the more you peel, the deeper it is. And the, the male disciples in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene represent, they are just totally into the persona. They are the disciples, right? They can understand only the kind of um, basic teachings. And she's the one that she's granted the esoteric teachings, the esoteric teachings. And I just, perhaps my uh, I necessarily overcomplicated it, but I wanted to stress that the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and the other Gospels were discovered in Egypt and there was such an immense tradition of esoterica in ancient Egypt. So instead of always taking it back, you know, to, to the other traditions like uh, on which, you know, the Bible is based, including Romanized tradition, right? Like, because if they had to adjust it for the Romans to understand it, I was trying to convey that, you know, it actually relates quite deeply to, um, um, to uh, uh, I just want to show you something to ancient Egyptian traditions as well, and I want to, if you don't mind, I'd like to share something that I think relates to is another Gnostic work. I just would like to quote for you for a moment because it is hundred percent amazing, and it's ancient Egyptian. Okay, I'm just going to just go very quickly through this. Oh, sorry, okay. move. Where is my uh, PowerPoint here? Uh, so. Just let me, oh, here. It's also in Nag Hammadi. This is um, Find the Perfect Mind, which is apparently based on Isis's teachings. I was sent from power. I came to those pondering me. I was found among those seeking me. Look at me, all who, are co who contemplate me. Do not ignore me, because I am the first and I am the last. I am she who is honored and I am she who is mocked. I am the whore and I am the holy woman. I am the wife and I am a virgin. And I think that, okay, it is supposed to relate to Isis, but it also for me relates very closely to Mary Magdalene because, you know, I am the whore and I am the holy woman. And this is what she represents. And in some ways it is also related back to this kind of dichotomy or polarity between Isis and Nephthys, which is, you know, one is the persona and one is the shadow, right? I hope I didn't complicate it, but it is kind of, it's, it's complicated. So can yeah, I just, so, this is not my book, my, um, this is the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. This is my book, but I talk about it, but not in such great detail, I'll be honest. I talk a lot about Isis and Mary Magdalene, and, you know, it's especially part two, three, and four, because first, uh, part one is more about sexuality and spirituality. And yeah. this, I just, what I have learned, you know, with such detail, uh, since I published the book, right. basic way, so yeah. maybe easier, definitely a much easier way. But since I published this book, I have learned, you know, why this text, like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, in some ways, like Jung, who is also not, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Cindy, who is also not necessarily very easy to read sometimes, right? It is because it is called in esoteric traditions, both of let's say Hinduism, like Tantra or ancient Egyptian tradition, it's called the twilight language. What does it mean? Why? Because why do you read esoteric text and it's just like, why do you give me a headache? You know, I read the Gospel of Mary Magdalene from 20 years and I kind of start to understand it. And I read it also not only as a scholar, but as a seeker. You know, I actually connected with this until he spoke with me. But twilight language means it is meant for the initiated. Yeah. We are not supposed to understand it unless you completely Mm, commit yourself, either you initiate it or you initiate yourself by your connection with the text. Yeah. So if you study it and you love it, it will speak to you. It's not like, you know, it's a little bit like reading beautiful poetry. You know, if, if you don't have a sense for it, you say, what kind of nonsense is that? 
you know it is difficult it is of... very difficult and i don't think no we, we cannot do it 100 percent unless you're absolute saint because you know uh like i need a job <laughs> simple. Yeah. You know, i went through initiation but to a different tradition and it helped me with the initiation to the gospel of mary magdalene because i went to a esoteric hinduism initiation and and and, and then um I have learned to study esoteric tantric texts uh, because I was initiated. And then that's why I could do Gospel of, Gospel of Mary Magdalene because I understood. It's almost like there is some esoteric language. It's almost like you enter certain level of esoterica and, and, and in this liminal space, they know you can understand. You know, it's, it's just, so initiation helps, but sometimes initiation is a formal, like I went through in, uh, formal initiation too esoteric hinduism uh, you know 20 I, years ago can I just... so for people who like because some people said that you're buying my book thank you so much um is that the first part is about uh, esoteric hinduism and and you know and eros as, as repressed and part two three and four is about mary magdalene so and, and Isis and so on. So just like if you open part one and you think, oh, why is she talking about it? You know, I want to learn about Mary Magdalene and Isis. So the rest of the book is about it because there are four parts. Only the first part is about Eros and part two and three and four is about uh, Isis, Mary Magdalene and Hathor and, you know, other uh, the, the, the lineage of goddesses actually that work their way through this, you know, and, and I believe that it culminated with Mary Magdalene. Cindy. I think Jung lived in this reality very up quite a bit since 1912, especially, right? When he was analyzing and, and he really lived in this liminal reality. And, and for Neoplatonists and ancient Egyptians and also for the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, uh, Nous is the liminal reality. It's just not material, but it is definitely that. <laughs> Thank you for detective work. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> there is a connection. Or, there is a connection, but they're actually two separate. It's also esoteric tradition of, of, of Egypt. Mm -hmm. yes. And so it's her her hermetic tradition. So, uh, however, Gnostics and Hermetics were kind of living both in Alexandria, but kind of arguing a little bit, but very similar. Yes. So they are bo both looking into the inner space. Right. But yeah. uh, I would say that maybe Hermetics were perhaps more... Uh, um, optimistic, perhaps I should say you, you just naturally uh, kind of um, flow into the divine when Gnostics, and this is what, you know, I talk about Gnostics because Jung was interested in them. They believe in the interiority of life and you eventually join with the divine, but they definitely kind of believe that there is an inner struggle, both individual and collective between good and evil. You know, because as long as we don't uh, integrate the shadow individually and collectively, it's going to manifest, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this is, but it's, if it, uh, so your intuition is spot on. They are very similar tradition, except that, you know, there are some, some differences, but they are both based in Egypt. Mm. Thank you. Yes, and, 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 and they teach pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Maybe I'll just the second one because I understood it more clearly and then I'll ask you to repeat the first question. So I think that the feminine, it's, it's a very complex thing and this is what actually this book is about. So I think, um, first of all, I don't think it's just a Western thing. In Western thing, yes, there is you no know, kind of push towards you know the masculine and masculine is definitely, uh, and especially in Jungian terms, I'm not, uh, by masculine, I'm not saying anything uh, against men. It's just, you know, we're encouraged, we live through the, um, this kind of form of consciousness, which is a masculine form of consciousness, whether women or men. And yeah. and on the other hand, in other cultures, perhaps uh, this uh, uh, form of feminine is limited because then just to this generative part, you understand what I mean? You can be only the mother, so to speak, and you cannot have any voice because I work, uh, I have many students from India and from other cultures and B Bhutan, you know, Buddhist and so on. And, and, and they say like, that's it, just shut up. Mm. You know, be a mother, a good mother, good daughter and shut up. Nobody, nobody cares what you think. And, um, uh, and that's it. 
So, so I, I think that, uh, and this is what I was trying to discuss in the other goddess because it is it is complex. Perhaps I was looking into past traditions when the feminine was in power, the archetypes. I was talking about archetypes two years ago of the feminine that were empowered, which did exist in the past. And now I, I think even if they didn't exist, which I know that they existed because you know I put it in my book after research. It means that we women, both women and men, have to take responsibility for empowering the feminine that is truly feminine, so to speak, not kind of, you know, uh, uh, barracuda feminine, you know, a corporate feminine, which is really a masculine in a dress, you know what I mean? And this is what I'm teaching in my class too, and not everybody likes it because, you know, there's a big push in the West, in Western society, as you said, for this kind of feminine that is disguised feminine, right? So women, the feminine faces this dilemma that, you know, in some cultures, you, you can be just the mother and you shut up and shut up. And traditionally, it's the mother is the mother, which is very passive. You know, we just kind of fertilize it and, and then it just produces children, but it has no voice. It's a mute feminine. Or, you know, you have to be really a masculine, right, to in a dress. So we have to find the way of integrating it. But, you know, that's why in the, in the other goddesses, I was looking at the lineage of goddesses where the feminine, you know, was empowered and it was feminine. It was not in, in a corporate pants, so to speak, right? And there are these examples of goddesses and Mary Magdalene is one of them, priestesses of goddesses or, you know, archetypes, you know, how, because this is this what they really are in Jungian language. So, um, and we have to uncover it, and you also have to experiment with this, which is not easy. That's why maybe there is so much confusion at the moment, right? Because the feminine is kind of awakening, but you know, people really don't know how to relate to it in a way. But uh, what was the first part of your question? You were saying something about before the feminine, but whether the levels can happen all at the same time. This is what you meant. That's right. Right, that it's not such a, oh, I passed level one, now I'm in level two. It, it kind of, you know, it's weaving itself through. It's just a kind of rhetorical um, method, really, you know, like there are these levels. But, and each esoteric tradition, like as I said, I was initiated formally to esoteric Hindu tradition, they have 36 levels. There are 36 tattvas. But it doesn't mean that you go from one, two, three, four, five. It just you know, uh, like in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, you had level four, and then who do you think you are? Where does it come from? This comes from like the very bottom, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you should not even hear this voice anymore because you're so, wow, woo, -woo you know, high. But no, it gets you again. And guess what? You have to address it, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you are completely right. They are not so clean cut at all to the very end. And because I've been around lots of spiritual teachers, I notice, uh, I'll just look into this in a moment. Uh, I notice that, you know, they are on a very high level, some of these teachers, and then they fall. And then they are still, they are still at a very high level of consciousness with the access to this divine silence and they completely screw up at the same time. So, you know, they go up and down as well. And they like really screw up. And it's usually either money or sex, which is very basic, right? And yet they are at this level of consciousness at the same time. It's not like they are, because the modern uh, philosophy or modern media would like to tell you that they're just corrupt, stupid teachers, which, you know, some of them perhaps are, but many of them are highly attained. And yet still, you know, but they are highly attained and they still screw up completely. European, uh, I'm actually, somebody says European Neolithic, so Maria Gambutas wrote a lot, a lot about it, and there are this Eurasian, um, Eurasian mysteries in, in, in Europe that talk exactly about the same things as ancient Egypt does. And I'm actually, in the book that I'm writing now, I'm looking into it in, in the European traditions as well. So, but... Uh, uh, so yes, so the short answer is yes. Yes, the same, it's, it's called Eurasian uh, Mysteries and they did exist in Europe as well. And it's the same story. You have to first uh, get resurrected and then you die. 
you know, and the, the, the whole reason of this resurrection when you're still alive is, you know, it's higher level of consciousness. So when you know that this is just a particular role we play and it's a particular plane, which is physical, but this is not what it is. So very recently, I, I know it uh, completely do not discredit myself, but now there are beautiful studies done by religious studies like uh, Dr. Diana Pasuka that talk about, uh, for example, UFOs, which Jung also did, another talk maybe, uh, as spiritual phenomena. You know, because most UFOs, like when they look into it, they're actually in, from liminal spaces. They are not sh spaceships. Right. So this is what I also write about in my next book, because uh, this is what we are basically rediscovering the uh, liminal spaces. So there's so much going on with liminal spaces. And uh, scientists from NASA, the great work of Diana Pasuka, it is that she's actually interviewing scientists from NASA who said they're downloading, downloading something, you know, from some entities and then they build rockets. OK, so there is actually physical <laughs> evidence for that downloads, which come from uh, liminal spaces. So, uh, yes. So a uh, uh, lot of really super exciting research is going on. And Freud again had a good intuition about it, <laughs> about UFOs, right? As, as uh, what is mechanical angels or something he, he was talking about. It. It's about Marija Gimbutas. Yes. And uh, yes, yeah, and question, the Luthian yeah. mys mysteries. So yes. Yeah. So that's very, yes. Thank you. I, thank you. And I, I'm just getting into it now, you know, for, for this book that I'm in the middle of about as well. So, but basically the answer is yes, it there was definitely going on. Right. And it's an interesting question, what is a Neolithic? Because there's Maria Gambutas, but now people are looking and there are more and more scientists talking that, you know, actually, I think we misunderstood our history, human history, and it's probably mm. much longer. And, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And probably in the, into the Mesolithic and. That's right. Paleolithic yeah. and. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And other lithics that haven't been named. That's right. <laughs> Nice. And I really appreciate everybody coming here and I apologize if it was a little bit complex, but it kind of required that, uh, you know, various connections and otherwise uh, the text is not even readable if you don't give us background, basically, and, you know, so, so thank right. you. My so pleasure each time. Mm -hmm.